Hello everyone and welcome back to Enter the Ether, the podcast all about the upcoming third-person MOBA ethereal Clash of Souls. I am your host, the one and only Magus. Joining me as always is the energetic, effervescent, illustrious Jelly Knees. How you doing, Jelly? I'm good, Mangoose. <laughs> I'm always like not sure where we're going each week. It could be long, it could be short. I gotta be ready for whatever it's gonna yep. be. You never know what uh, I'm gonna but do. this week we have a special guest with us here. And it is UG Skifter, who's on the GDA and programming teams at UG. So Skifter, go ahead and tell the people what you do for both of those things. I am on the programming and GDA teams separately, but also at the same time. So I am on the programming team, and that is what I originally was on the team to do, and program behind the scenes stuff and not really be in the spotlight with GDA and not really work on actual game mechanic stuff, but I play a lot of League, and it is my downfall. And th <laughs> the team slowly figured that out, and then I got dragged into GDA. Not many and people would say they got drugged into GDA. That's like, a, <laughs> that's like a lot of people's dream right there. Picking and screaming <laughs> from behind the desk where all of his code is sitting. <laughs> <laughs> so... We're going to change things up just a little bit this week. Uh, as always, we're going to go through the latest updates that we got from uh, Undying Games, but then we're going to talk to Skifter about programming and GDA. I'm specifically interested in programming because I'm at a loss. I don't understand that at all. And then, But after that, we picked a, uh, a fan myth, uh, created a fan myth from the Discord, and we're going to go over to that and um, just you know offer some opinions and talk about it a little bit. So let's uh let's dive right into it here, Jelly. I, I, it's kind of become a tradition that you explain the latest update. So I'm going to let you go for it, man. Uh, so I mean, I was right. Let me first off you say when right. I was right, you were and right. Mangoose didn't believe me. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'll say this. I've known about familiars for probably about two years now. I've known that they were going to be in the game for a very long time. I thought that they were just going to be cosmetic, and I thought it was, oh, this is a great way to for, for the game to make some money. I had no idea they were actually going to be linked to a system. <laughs> and a core um, system at like that. It, yeah, yeah, no kidding. But so, very, very basically, uh, I'll kind of cover what the familiars are, and then Skiff there will go into way more detail than <laughs> even I understand. But basically, the familiar system will be tied into the loadout system, and they will offer unique abilities or skills that you can use as well as potions of some kind um in in addition to the loadout system that'll be variable that you can change the skill that they have and the potion if i remember correctly but go ahead skip there and explain in way better detail than i just did so yeah in 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 the myth select but pre-game lobby you're gonna you're gonna get to pick a, a familiar to go along with your myth and basically that familiar is tied to a class. They got the four classes. I'm not going to go into too much detail on those because you've seen them all. But the load, the, the familiar that you select ties directly to the loadout type that you have to pick and the stats that go along with it. So if you want to go a protector familiar, you have to go into the protector tree for all of your stats, if that mm -hmm. makes sense. Um, that is also why we kind of left the arbitrary fourth one as like a custom stat. And I'm not going to go into detail on exactly what those are, but they're pretty much all the rest of them that reside in the other trees, but it's going to cost you a little bit more. So say you wanted to go, you know, I say this one a lot, but AD tank Noxus, like you can go the, <laughs> yeah, I, I don't know, <laughs> but you can go the AD, the assault familiar. And then on that fourth one, you can take a tank stat along with the other ones, but you're going to mainly go the assault stuff. So that's where you're kind of tied to with the familiar. And then the abilities of the familiars will also be of the assault type. Okay. All yeah, right. I think I get that. One of the things they covered a little bit, though, was the, the marks and masks. Uh, item tree, which are support and jungle items, the masks being a support item, the marks being a jungle item. They were saying that you could replace your um, your familiar familiar's ability with either a mark or mask ability. So yes, so the way that the, that it works is like 
you have the four different classes for familiars. Each class of familiar has a class ability and the class potion. They also have an exclusive ability, an exclusive passive that is unique to that familiar. The class ability is the one that you can change to either be able to get the jungle item in game or the support item. In. So you will lose the class ability for that familiar in order to get the item in game. If that and that's sense. so you're saying that the the masks and marks items are specifically locked off to people with that ability, correct? Yes. Okay. Yes. If you want the ability to buy your jungle mark, you have to take the uh, ability. You have to swap out your your familiar class ability for that jungle ability. So just because it's the game I play as well and understand, it's like League of Legends smite system that you can't build the smite items if you don't have smite. You are correct. Yes. Yeah. Okay, right on. Uh, that clears it up a little bit for me. Um so say I'm I'm just going to I'm not this is just me coming off the top of my head. None of this is official. But like, okay, so we got the owl that I've been calling calling Bandana Owl because he looks like he's got bandana. a got a bandana. Yeah. Um, let's say that his special ability is some sort of vision related thing. Like you can send your owl to fly about and scout a bush for you or something like that. So if you if the owl was a support type familiar and you took like uh was from the protect or something like that, and you would replace that scouting ability with the mask ability? So each one has two. So that scouting ability would more than likely be the exclusive to the owl. Okay. Whereas the class ability would be something that goes on all the familiars and it's not exclusive to just that one. So it'd be more generic. And that is the one that you would replace. So for instance, right. something like if you had a blink or a flash, you'd replace that with the, the mark item, not yes. the more specific to that familiar. Correct. Yeah. If it's okay. something super specific to that familiar, that's going to be the exclusive ability. But like, say it was just like a generic shield or something. On okay. on the yeah, you would just replace that basically. Okay. And just to make sure, and for everybody else, the four classes that you're talking about are the assault, protect, reinforcement, demolition. Correct. Yes. Okay. All right. Awesome. And is there? I mean, maybe you can get into it. Maybe you can't. Is there a set number of familiars to each class or loadout class? Um, I don't know. I I know at at least for the pre alpha, I think we're doing eight total. I'm not sure. I th I'm assuming it's two of e two in each. Mm -hmm. I'm not 100 percent sure. I know there's going to be eight. Um, it would only make sense for it to be two, 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 two. But um, yeah. and I know we're going to be continuously adding more as the game goes. So they're going to come out just as frequently as myths, at least for the beginning, because we want as many as possible. So it, it, they're going to be they're going to be flying. Because they're going to all have, they're like mini myths. So they're, they're going to have, there's going to be a whole level of micro play involved in just the familiars being how many there are. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. And you'll be able to Yet tell. Yet another system to make Ethereal more complicated. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> you'll be able to tell just by looking at an enemy what class they picked up, what build they're using, yeah. um, by looking at what familiar, familiar, familiar they have. You are correct. Which is great. I think that's something that if you're going to offer unique abilities, being able to at a glance know at least the the base ability of that familiar, I think is huge. Yeah. So this is a lot of abilities to manage. I'm going to have to like bring back my old Warcraft piano playing <laughs> <laughs> techniques. Get one of the MMO mice that has like 30 buttons on the <laughs> side just so you can use them all. <laughs> yeah. 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 I don't, I don't really, I don't know. Um, I would, I don't know how, I don't know if I like them being tied to the, um, to the loadout system, because I would just like to pick the one that I think looked the best, to tell you the truth. Right. Like, I would almost prefer that they simply be cosmetic. I think this might be, in my opinion, I think this might be overkill. Of course, we got to see how it works in the game and how, you know, th this is all speculation right now. But me personally, just looking at it from from the outside in, I I would rather it just be cosmetic and I just pick something to pal around with me instead of having all this added complexity. But uh, I'm a simple kind of guy, so I don't know. 
Yeah, I don't know. We'll we'll see what we can uh, add to the system to and make it better. You may or may not be able to answer, and it may or may not have even been discussed at this point. Will there be cosmetics for the familiars themselves? I like will for Bandana yeah. Owl. Will I be able to buy a a Hedwig skin that he's white instead of being brown? That would be amazing, hundred percent. But uh, <laughs> I, gen- I genuinely Confirmed. do not know. I genuinely do not know the answer. Question. All right. On. No, Skifter said it. It's happening, UG. You know sure. now it's a thing. He's admitted to it. He's gonna have a wand. <laughs> I think that's about all I had for familiars. Uh Jelly, Skifter, anything? I think that's it for me. I got nothing. Nothing all right. else. Cool. Let's uh let's head right into the programming and GDA questions with Skifter. Um a lot of the, my questions are gonna be coming off the hip because like I said, I don't really understand the programming side of things. I've through the years of tracking all this stuff, I understand a lot of what goes on, but the programming just... <laughs> right Here, I, I can break it down real simple for you. You take your keyboard, you press a bunch of zeros and ones into the <laughs> keyboard, and then eventually it comes out into skip their wins ethereal coming out. Soon. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think you cut out there. <laughs> <laughs> I think I think I think actually the binaries I think they come out as Rick Roll. I'm not sure. <laughs> but I think that that's they what do. Was I've seen them myself. <laughs> oh my god. All right, but let's just I mean head right into the questions. Can you tell us like what elements you've helped program um for Ethereal? So I've dabbled in a little bit of here and there of a lot of things. Um I did the mini map all, like the the functionality of the minimap, um, I worked on the announcer system, um, the jungle camps. I did a bit of the the base fundamentals of the jungle camps was done by our lead a long time ago. Um, I've done I basically just fleshed out the rest of that system for him uh, while he's on other things. Um, I've also worked with Paige a lot on like placement of the jungle camps and that that's more on the GDA side than the programming side. Um and then the breakable stuff around the map I've done also with Paige a lot. What what should we break? What should we not break? Uh but again that all goes into programming as well because that all has to be programmed in the back end anyways. Um so yeah, that's just some of the things that I've worked on. Do you work on back? Yeah, a little bit a little bit of everything there. Do you work um, no, on back not, end not stuff like, too, or not straight back end? We have like a for that, but like more front end back end, like not in game, but like still. Well. Right on. So, uh, which of the uh, the the class actives? Uh, <laughs> Jelly has a note here: actives, not passives. Always, yeah. always, mis- always mix that up myself and say passives, <laughs> but they are active. The class actives. Um, what, can you talk about which ones were the hardest to balance and as opposed to create? Because you had to, you have to program those and balance them, I guess. Yeah. So I'm going to say the Berserkers was the hardest to balance because you have the Sky Slayers that can just go wherever they want. You have the Reapers that can also just go wherever they want. And then you have the Berserkers, which have to go through things, but they can't go through everything. <laughs> so you kind of have to decide, like, do I want to break this wall? Do I want this wall to be breakable? Because, like, if they're jungling against a Sky Slayer, you want them to be able to keep up. You don't want them to just be completely outclassed from the get-go. Because, you know, Sky Slayers can just go over a wall. Reaper can just go over a wall. But now a Berserker could just break that same wall. So, like, I think the Berserkers was pro- is probably the hardest to, to manage on that front because they have to be able to keep up with tempo and it's going to impact, you know, a competitive environment more so than, you know, a normal environment, but it's still something that needs to be thought about. That makes a lot of sense to me in that like all the other classes seem like they they have numbers that you could tweak to help balance exactly. them if they come across as too strong or too weak, but numbers the berserkers are, just... are really like direct in how they influence everything. Yeah. So it's right. I yeah, it makes way more sense that that's the hardest one to balance. Like we could dictate how long a sky slayer flies in the air. Like mm-hmm. But we can't dictate exactly what walls. Like, we can now, but, like, maybe not later on. Berserkers can only break through three-fourths of this wall. You all, you have to get a second Berserker to come in to break through the rest of it. <laughs> yeah, that would be a pain. That really seems like <laughs> something... probably a pain to program, too. I bet. 
It's something that can really get away from people, too. Like, a really good player will be able to break shit at just the right moment, and right. the bad players will break it at the exact wrong moment to, like, trap their <laughs> own team in and stuff mm-hmm. like that. So that's it's really going to hinge on um, the experience of the community, I would think. So that's that's going to be a constant battle, I would, going forward with the Berserkers. Each class definitely has their own their own skill ceiling, for right. sure. And th- I think the way I see it, I think a lot of other community members, all a lot of which hailing from Paragon, think of like Rampage. What if a Rampage boulder just blocked, stayed around after I threw it? Like, it, that's a weird thing to think about, to have to, I'm sure, balance around that thought as well. Yeah. And how long, and all this other stuff. Mm-hmm. Yep. So kind of just a more personal thing for you. What was what's the thing that you most enjoyed working on or setting up for either pre- uh, programming or GDA? I'm going to have to go with myth creation. Okay. Make creating myths is really fun because you just <laughs> have the imagination to do whatever you want. Realistically, no you don't, but you can kind of can. You get away with a lot more. Um and yes, I am creating a myth, and no, I not, cannot tell you anything about it. Um, but on the programming side, it's probably knowing the fact that things that you're doing could potentially be in this game forever. Because like where we are right now, we're working on the fundamentals of this. And the fundamentals of this game could potentially be in this game in 10 years. Mm-hmm. Like, that's just a fact of it. And, and knowing that is it's really kind of cool. It's really neat. So does your your background in programming, and you're talking about um you know the balance of programming and everything. Does what you the the things that would be easier or harder or things that are more fun to program does that ever affect the way that you approach GDA? Like you know that you can program this a myth to do this, so you're like, let's have this myth do this. Does that does that ever happen? Um. So it does occasionally. I'm not going to get into specifics on this, but there was an example where programming was like, hey, GDA, you can't do this. It's not going to (laughs) work. Sorry, not sorry. And so then GDA had to go back and switch it. And so, I mean, like you get the bounce back on that. Like GDA is like, oh, my gosh, we have this great idea. And then programming is like, that's not going to work how you think it's going to work. And then they have to go back and redo it. So, like, in my ex- experience doing both, I can kind of see if a situation like that were to happen and prevent it from the beginning. But not everybody has that kind of background in gaming that I do when programming. So I guess it's a it's a perk. So, <laughs> And I mean, you, you kind of answered this for GDA influencing programming and vice versa. But how does the map creation come into that? We talked with Paige before, and the map is... There's a balance aspect to the map as well, and I know you and her work together quite often. But how often do the people on the map design team say, like, put something in you, and programming has to step in and be like, "We can't do that either." Like, it's not just it's not just on a GDA perspective; it's also a map perspective on top of that. Yeah, it it, it happens quite a bit uh, because, <laughs> well, you will use the example of the breaking rocks because, like, if level design puts in a rock that isn't breakable, but programming needs it to be breakable. Or programming designed a rock that is breakable. Well, then level design has to then change out that rock to a rock that is breakable. And then if they place it in the wrong place, then GDA is like, hey, this is wrong. And then they have to change it again. It just, <laughs> it just kind of bounces around, but yeah. Makes it all sense. works out in the end. So with the, um, you were talking about the mini-map and everything. I'm sure that made it a hell of a lot easier once you guys decided to go with the uh, the new map structure to do a mini-map. But yeah. is there other ways in which um, this sort of separate map structure has changed the way you approach your job as a programmer and as a GDA? Yeah, it was actually interesting because I basically had to make three different maps, like functionality-wise, because they all are separate, because the lanes are separate, and it's not just flat. So it was, it was definitely interesting to make that, because then you have to combine them all together. Yeah, it's kind of it's interesting because programming wise, you know how to do something, you know how to make a mini map, 
but then you have to do it three times and somehow combine it back into one, which has never been done before in the MOBA genre. So like you don't really have something to to bounce back on, like something to look at. You, there's no other game that you can go look at and be like, oh, that's how they did it. No, right. you're just kind of you're just kind of on the fly. Like, well, is this gonna work? Is it not gonna work? Well, we'll see. Like that sort of thing until until you figure something out that that actually does work, and you're like, great, I did it. <laughs> I think the mini map to me is one of the things that I'm most intrigued about for Ethereal of like the smaller things. Mm -hmm. um because it's it's a matter of thinking about like how is that going to work they're separated but they're also the same map but they're not but like it's a whole and i imagine you went through hundreds of iterations of those thoughts in oh, programming yeah. the mini map but i think that's one of the smaller bigger systems that i'm really excited to see how it works yeah so am i <laughs> <laughs> but you so heard it I. here guys if the mini map is bad yell at skifter yell at me hey that, that's sure <laughs> feedback let's the do it the second it doesn't work properly the second okay, you well, think I, that you, uh, the award didn't see someone <laughs> <laughs> r.i.p <laughs> my dms are full yeah Leave a message, please. <laughs> all right so how did you uh how did you become interesting in programming and GDA? um so i'm actually I actually have a computer science degree. I just graduated last year. Um, I uh, was looking for a job as a programmer and game design specifically. And I found this project and I was like, well, shoot, let's just go for it. Like, it's a MOBA. That's literally all I play. And then I got on the team and I was like, shoot, there's some pretty talented people on this programming team. Like, I can learn a lot from these guys. And yeah, that wasn't wrong. <laughs> so well, that's good to hear. Yeah, there's some there's some pretty good people in here. So I def shout out to them. They know what they're doing <laughs> more so than I do. I think that's one of the things that amazes a lot of the community is when you look into the people working on Ethereal, they they know what they're doing. Like so many, if not all, of the people on the project you see some of the stuff that they've made in their free time and you're like, how did you, this person's working on this game? Like what? Yeah. Yeah. Where did this come across? How you did so many talented world, people? Like... Yeah. How did so many talented people find the same project? Like it's crazy. It's crazy. It's crazy. Yeah. Yeah. Owen and Kai pulled it all together out. They've got such a crazy amount of talent that they pulled together for this game. Just, out of nothing like it's all it's all volunteer mm -hmm. at this point i mean eventually yeah. hopefully everybody will get paid but it's all volunteer and, for now and the talent's not just in programming either like it, it's everywhere so it makes me wonder why owen must have a silver tongue or something <laughs> <laughs> uh so in you i mean you said your favorite thing is myth design and creating new myths uh from the ones that we know about Wh who is your favorite myth? I'm gonna go with Noxus. I am a Noxus sim. <laughs> All right. Well, the word is banned on Twitch now, but luckily this isn't going on Twitch. Okay. So AD tank Noxus simp, right? <laughs> oh yeah, for sure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was sure, example because sure. that's what he plays already, and it's already <laughs> way too strong. So he's just letting everybody know now. <laughs> yep. Is uh, is that something? Are mages something that you normally play in other games? Uh, you mentioned that you have a background in law. Do you have other MOBAs that you played, and do you normally like play mage style heroes? Yeah, like myths? Raw and Smite. Like, yeah, just mages. <laughs> right. Raw on. and Smite is typically what I play when I've played Smite. I don't play it very much anymore, but Raw was pretty much the the simplest go to one. Um, Victor also has a very very similar play style in League that Raw does, and I play Victor quite a bit. Yeah. So that might give us a little bit of a clue as to how Noxus plays. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> cough, cough. Uh, <laughs> no, I didn't make Noxus, but it's okay. Noxus is gonna be, she's gonna be fun. She's gonna I do be love her fun. voice people lines. Be, do love her voice lines. People mm -hmm. are gonna be pleasantly surprised and impressed with her. <laughs> it's it's good. I like it. So how does the so between working on on both programming and gda how do you guys divide work amongst the teams to help get things implemented correctly on both sides 
or is it just kind of a everybody works on one project at the same time and moves on to the next one? Um, there's there's like a uh, uh like a master list so to speak that we all have. Uh, I don't know how some of the other departments do it, but like GDA has like a there's like a database and like we have like all go through all the time. And same thing with programming. There's like a master list and then the, like the list gets divided between everybody and like the the leads in both departments kind of dictate where things go who can who works on what based on you know skill and availability and time and stuff like that and eventually everything gets done and more right. gets added onto the list <laughs> <laughs> um so one thing i wanted i wanted to touch on so if other people out there are are interested in programming and, and the like uh, do you have any advice for them i mean you went to school for it of course, they can always go to school for it, but if they just want to, if they're if they're in high school or something, they just want to dabble in it, dip their toes in it. Get if they're if you're like me, an old fucker that's never going to go to college, but I still want to <laughs> kind of get my hands in the program because it's one of one of the main things I just really don't understand. What advice would you give someone that wants to, like I said, dip their toes into programming? So believe it or not, there's actually a lot of resources online. Like a lot, a lot more than you probably realize because learning programming, like there's so many different languages in programming, but it's just like normal human languages. Like they each have their own style of formatting and like all this other stuff, but you, that's all stuff that you can learn and practice just online. Like you can go online and be like, look up like Java, look up C++. You look up all these programming languages like how they work and you could just watch endless videos because people teach these things. There's a lot of free resources online that you could definitely find and get into if you were interested in programming side. Right on. Cool. Uh, that That's all the questions I had. Jelly, you have anything? Yeah, no, that's for programming GDA stuff. That's all I got too. All right, cool. Uh, well, let's move on now. This is a, this is a myth submitted by infinite stupid in the uh, discord. And, um, we're just going to go through, talk about the abilities. They, that's one of the requirements that you put in, like numbers and stuff. I guess, Jelly, you were saying that was one mm -hmm. of the requirements that they had for the, like the competition or whatever. We're not going to talk. It's obviously a bunch of arbitrary numbers that don't mean anything to anyone right now because we haven't even seen the <laughs> game. But uh, we're just going to go through and talk about some of the abilities they gave them. This is Haborim, the Titan Slayer. Anybody else got a different pronunciation for that? You you nailed it in one. Hey, yep, hey, <laughs> that's what I thought hey, too. There you go. Yeah. Uh, backstory is a work in progress, but the class is a marksman, and um, their basic attack is is with a crossbow and fires one projectile. I think this is important to note: one projectile which moves at nine hundred units per second, dealing sixty five damage to his target. Um, I would assume that since it's a projectile that it would have a little bit further range than a regular basic attack since, I mean, well, I guess even in Paragon, everything was a projectile, but when I hear crossbow and projectile, I think more of like an arrow that has a little bit more travel time than a bullet. I had the same thought as well. And kind of that it could be something that has fall off over distance. And so you could arc the shot, and if you can land that basic attack from a huge distance by arcing it, then more power to you. But that's a huge skill that you'd have to learn and develop by playing this myth. Yeah, like Hanzo from Overwatch. Very much. Yeah. So, uh, I mean, would that be uh, a programming difficulty, Skifter, to, to add? I mean, I don't even know what the basic attacks are like anyway, but like, um, hit scan. I guess hit scan versus projectile. Add. It's projectile. It, it, you just add the the gravity aspect to it, and just like have it arc over time. It doesn't it doesn't seem too hard. It's just like an extra component that wouldn't normally be there. Yeah, right on. And then the passive is Titan Slayer. The basic attacks deal an additional da uh, additional damage equal to twelve point five percent of the difference between the maximum HP and theirs. So if they have higher HP than him then his attacks would deal 12.5% of the difference of that damage. That would be really hard to work out in my head. That would be something you would really have to get a feel for. This is like kind of a true damage passive. Uh, what do you guys think about this? Well, you're not building health on this guy, ever. No, nope. <laughs> Mega glass cannon. Yeah. 
you just want to build them straight glass cannon. Don't never build health. You're trolling. <laughs> <laughs> the kind of thought I had about this passive was that it makes me think that their auto attacks would be slower than the majority of of marksmen's, at least to start the game. In that, because it's going to do this extra damage, and you're going to build that glass cannon aspect, you just start attacking slower, and then you build up, and that's when you're doing late game this amount of damage because you built the attack speed up and can get this just really, really quickly. Yeah. Um, and then ability one, combat slide. Hayborum dashes in the target location, um, traveling whatever units over 1.5 seconds. It has a cooldown. The notes for this are while sliding, he can perform basic attacks, but he cannot cast abilities, and his hitbox is lowered towards the ground. So, um, from a programming perspective, how hard would it be to make it so that um, his hitbox is actually lowered? I mean, would that be extremely difficult to do? I'm actually not sure on that. Um, in theory, it shouldn't be. Because the hitbox is tied to the the model, right? So like, it shouldn't change anything, honestly, it shouldn't at all. As long as you're putting the model towards the ground, I think it, that would be more of like an animation thing. Hmm. And then um, being able to basic attack with this would, I mean, that would be some just sweet plays that you would be pulling off, like <laughs> yeah, sliding, like sliding, and, and yeah, <laughs> turning, auto attacking as you're sliding. That'd be pretty cool. The fadeaway like shot, dash... killing somebody, like, yeah. absolutely. <laughs> I do like the, the fact that the dash gets significantly longer the more points you put into the ability, but mm -hmm. the duration of the dash stays the same. So you're just gonna start flying, basically. <laughs> 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 I didn't even notice that. I guess the numbers start do kind of do kind of matter here. <laughs> this so this next ability is something that I think is probably one of the coolest parts about this kit in just it's so it's a trap system so Haberim throws an imp impaler trap with a certain amount of health to a target location lasting 30 seconds the trap takes half a second to arm itself after arming if an enemy walks within a certain distance it locks onto them with a needle tipped chain tethering them to the trap they can't move beyond a certain range around the trap for two seconds and it deals damage to them over that same amount of time if they get tethered by two traps, they're rooted and can't move at all for the same duration. I I love this. Yeah, <laughs> I think it's... this is a cool little ability that you can set up well to get either a little bit of advantage by one trap, or if you, you set it up right and they get hit by two, then you just jump on this person. There's definitely like levels to what you can do with this. Yeah, there's definitely a skill ceiling to this. While not being hard at first, there is definitely a higher aspect of play that you could pull off potentially if you know what your ability. Yeah, you throw mm -hmm. one of these suckers in a bush, assuming that there's bushes of some sort in the game. I don't even know, but I'm just thinking in terms of other mobas. Like you throw this trap in a bush, and then somebody s steps in it, and then they can't move. They can still move and attack and use abilities, but like any kind of AOE type ability that's that's hard to hit if they're rooted in place like that. It's it's going to hit him. It makes me think. Yeah, of, I know that they, if you just focus it on the trap, if you know your AOE will cover the entire area around the trap, just throw it in the middle. They can't dodge it. Yeah. Oh man, dude, that's crazy. It makes me think of Lambs to the Slaughter, which is an ultimate in Heroes of the Storm for the Butcher, where he he throws a spike down, you're chained to it, and you can't move within a certain. Like if you try and move, you get bounced back in. How that silences as well, so that's a huge pain in the ass. But you know, it's an ultimate. This isn't. An ultimate is just a regular ability. And uh, it has two charges we see here in the notes. So you can have two traps out at the same time, which, as Jelly was saying, you get hit with both of them, you get rooted. Cool stuff. Mm -hmm. um, very, yeah. very, very unique ability. The third ability, Hunter's Grasp. He arms his harpoon. His next basic attack will use up the harpoon, I guess, into his, uh, he puts it in his crossbow. Dealing to his target additional physical damage and embeds itself in the target for up to three seconds, slowing them by 10%, but has a limited range of 500 units. During this time, Heberum is tethered to his target, being dragged along with them if they attempt to move by, uh, beyond 500 units from him. But he can recast the ability for half of its original mana cost during this time. 
And then the uh, recast is he rips the harpoon out of the enemy that the harpoon is embedded in. Um, it untethers himself from them and deals uh, some bleed damage. And then um, the notes, while the harpoon is embedded, he cannot basic attack. And if he tries to move beyond the 500 units away from the target while the harpoon is embedded in them, the target will not be drug with him. And uh, the Titan Slayer, his passive, does not apply to the ba to basic attacks empowered by this ability. So basically, this seems like th this would be his right click, his um, his risk reward, because while he does this, the target is slowed, but the target can drag him out of position if it's still <laughs> attached to them, and he can't basic attack while he has this going on. So. Yeah, this I, I would think this will be his right click risk reward type ability. Um what do you guys think of the uh the, the hunter's grasp? So the, the literally the first thing I thought of when I saw that he moves with him was Scion and League, his ult, he just goes in a direction until he hits something and he's unstoppable so you can't stop him. So if this guy oh just God. like got onto Scion, he's just gonna go. <laughs> and yeah, you're just stuck. Like, sorry, you're out of luck, dude. See, I would just make like Moby Dick references if I was ever using this ability <laughs> the whole time. Uh, just or fishing references. I'm gonna go fish and just hook on somebody and just get drug along behind him. I think that'd be incredible. That'd be great. That'd be great. The only thing, the only change I think I would make is that um, re recasting it it would involve some sort of cast time because it's not that much of a risk if you can just pull the harpoon out of him. Do it and let go. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. It would have to be like a delay. Like you have to be attached for like one or two seconds. Yeah. At least. But yeah, if there's I no really way like... around then. Yeah. I really like that. It's kind of like a supportive carry ability because it's a marksman. So at least in the way we've always thought about it, be it with Dante and malware marksmen are going to be the carries of the game. So having a supportive ability because he can't basic attack, maybe he could use his traps at the same time. But the fact that he's stuck and slowing them down, that gives his team the opportunity to do something where it's usually the other way around is really interesting to me. Yeah, and the other the other layer of skill is looking at the traps. Because if you hit somebody with a trap and then hit them with this ability, they have to stay in the area around the trap anyways. So yeah. there's, no, you, there's no risk you're not going to get dragged under a turret. <laughs> you're, you're good. The what about cliffing people with this ability, That's what right? I just you get of. hooked by this well, guy, and jump off the edge, and just, okay, you're coming with me. Like, that, that's later. what I was just thinking. That, that, that's the biggest risk is you hook a Sky Slayer and they just fly up. And, <laughs> and you're in <laughs> combat when it, when it comes off. <laughs> Recast, I dare you. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Do it. Do it. <laughs> oh, that'd be crazy. That's good. <laughs> Seeing somebody get dragged through the sky. <laughs> All right. The final one is his ultimate. Jelly, you want to talk about this one? Yeah, so this is Titanic Spear. Hayborn puts away his crossbow, takes out an amulet, and holding it out in front of him, shoots an energy spear from the amulet with a global range. The spear pierces through enemies, dealing damage to each enemy it hits, increasing for every mini enemy after that. Uh, crazy. I mean, it's a global, like, ultimate. So, like, we saw with, like, Dante or Murdoch, things like that. But it's going to be traveling across the map instead of just being a hit scan across the entire way. But that's... The fact that it builds up more damage, if you use this in a team fight with six myths, <laughs> and you're stacking it five times before it hits the final person, it could do crazy amounts to the back line. Yeah, I mean, wild. If you could catch two different people in your traps, they would be stacked right in front of each other, and then you could... You can lay him out with this, especially the person, that, and then just some random person that's coming out of spawn gets <laughs> takes the, <laughs> the full stacked effect in the face. <laughs> yikes! Oh, yikes. poor Evan. I was gonna say it would be Evan. I think that all just went through our heads. <laughs> <laughs> May he rest in peace in base. <laughs> <laughs> so that uh, that that was all the abilities. Uh, that was uh, pretty fun. Don't really know, since it's the first one, I can't really... I'm just going to give it a, a star rating, but I can't give it five stars since it's the first one, because I don't know what I'm going to be comparing We haven't established a scale yet, against. yeah. So I'm just going to give it four stars for now, and this 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 one's going to be my baseline. Um, I do think there's a lot of really cool stuff here, 
Uh, there are some stuff that I think I would improve on, so I'm not going to give it five stars. And then the I think the ultimate is a little too close to Dante's as far as uh, being <laughs> just cross map uh, to 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 give it five stars. But I don't know, man. Goose, does it blow out your eardrums when you use it? Because true. I mean, that's really that's, that's all that matters about Dante's <laughs> ultimate. Dropping that bass. <laughs> <laughs> so, all right. I think that's all I've got. So, uh, Skifter, anything you wanted to say to uh, to the fans before uh, before we close out here? Soon, guys. It's it's coming. Trust me, <laughs> it's coming. We know. We hear you. All right. Kind of talking about this this myth concept that we just did. Uh, if you guys submit myths, or yeah, submit myths in the Discord. Go ahead and tag either Mangoose or myself in the Discord, and we'll take a look at it, and maybe it'll come up in a future Enter the Ether. Maybe. Yeah. I probably should have asked if it's stupid if, <laughs> before I used this. <laughs> Too late now! <laughs> Too late now. <laughs> We're not re-recording 40 minutes. Not happening. Sorry, Infinite. Yes, we are. All right. <laughs> All right. Got, like, copyright <laughs> issues already on it, and he's about to take us down, Mangoose. All right, so let's do plugs. Uh, Skifter, do you have a, like a uh, Twitch, YouTube, Instagram, anything you want to plug? Not really. Nah. Nah. Okay. Nah. Good. Yeah. <laughs> There's this little game you're working on called Ethereal. Plug that. Yeah, Ethereal Clash of Souls. You know, you might have heard of it. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Jelly, anything to plug this week? More YouTube videos. Man, Ooh, you've been yay. pumping them yeah. out. Yeah, you pranking, have been pumping. Pranking them out, man. And when we get more information, I'll make more. So it's just, it's going to keep going, hopefully. <laughs> it's a win-win. I know. But uh, we're going to be live streaming on YouTube and Twitch this week as well. So if you subscribe to the YouTube, you'll get notifications there. You don't need to follow me on Twitch at the same time because we'll multi-stream to both platforms. But yeah, YouTube videos, live streams, that's about it for me. What about you, Mangoose? I got jack shit. So, uh... <laughs> 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 so. Again, uh, uh, with 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 every UG employee that we've had here, you've seen how much passion they have for the project for for the project and how much skill they are they're bringing to the table. It's just it's really impressive. It's really fun to see. I can't wait till we get this game just in our hands. Um, I hope all of you are as excited as us to finally enter the ether. Mangoo.